in a lot of jurisdictions, especially the Socialist Republic of California <laughs> and the Socialist Republic of New York, you got real problems if you're a landlord in those places because you just have no rights. It's not going to be your choice and your savvy business dealings and your kind heart that is going to guide your actions. It's going to be very anti-landlord, landlord-unfriendly regulations. Obviously, 2020 has been crazy and, you know, you know uh, it's over. Now we're in 2021 and people are kind of questioning, you know, where are we headed? Uh, we have all kinds of things happening right now. We have new administration coming in. We got the CARES Act pumped down the road, you know, till the end of um January. And then we have all these forbearance, all these rental issues around evictions. Uh, you know, the states have affordability issues. We have unemployment issues. So with all of that, you know, let's discuss the rental moratorium. You know, obviously it's a mess. And, um, you know, when somebody doesn't pay, uh, obviously, uh, in one of your rentals, then you, of course, it's a tougher uh, you can't really pay your mortgage and uh, it's obviously there's no cash flow. And so it, it's just a kind of a, as you would say, trickle down, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I call this actually trickle up economics trickle because up. yeah, you know, you know, when the, when the landlord doesn't get his rent, what does he do? He plays the game of hot potato. He goes to the lender and says, sorry, I can't pay. It's a mess, but it is what it is. So how you do know? you think the government gets us out of this? You know, I think, and I, I kind of hate to say this philosophically, but I'm coming around to the idea on my podcast a while back, I had presidential candidate Andrew Yang. And you know, Andrew, I don't know if you've interviewed him, but he's, he's the one guy that ran for president when his platform was really centered around UBI or universal basic income. And interestingly, you know, I've been talking with a lot of my very libertarian, successful entrepreneur friends. And they just don't think, I mean, I'm surprised these guys would say this, like that they're coming around to the idea of universal basic income. And you know what? I am too. And I got to tell you the the reason is forget about the pandemic, forget about the civil unrest and the new administration, whatever, right? All these crazy things going on in the world, just technology alone is going to displace so many jobs, Ken, and it is going to take a long time for people to adapt and to retool. Now, throughout history, they always have retooled. You know, when Elias Howe invented the sewing machine, there was an outcry from both men and women wondering, what will women do with all their spare time? I think we figured that out. Okay. <laughs> you know? I dare you to bring that up today. You'd get slapped for that one. But what's also interesting, if you look at the Department of Labor or something, they do this survey, right, of all the jobs. And the only job that has actually been completely lost in the last hundred years due to technology, there's only one job that has gone away. Elevator operator. Now people have to push the button themselves and operate the elevator by themselves without an expert. So there you go. So, so you mentioned UBI or universal basic yeah. income. And, and I, 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 like you, I'm starting to come around. People need money. Yeah. They, you know, the government yeah. said, stay home, you know, get well, stay healthy. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, your employer is, um, you know, maybe we're going to give them money. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're going to give, yeah. maybe we're going to bail out the landlord. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe we're going to bail out the rent. Maybe not. But this is, yeah. uh, you know, th I do think this is coming. Is that, is that um, do you think that, that's coming soon or you think it's going to be in the foreseeable future? You know what? So many people would object so vociferously to it that I don't know how soon it'll come, but I kind of think it needs to happen because, you know, if you just give the money to the people directly and, you know, not to if we, look, we saw in this last bill, everybody's so outraged about the foreign countries that got the money and this and that. And then, you know, when it comes to giving it to the businesses or the landlords, it's like, that's all so uneven and it's so hard to figure out. What's simple is that if you just pay everybody a thousand bucks a month, 
it's done. Yeah. Right. They're going to spend that money. The, the, you know, the rich will stick it in their bank account. Okay. So what, maybe they'll invest it and they'll create, you know, economic growth that way. But for sure the poor will buy some groceries. It's just simple. Now here's the danger in it though. And I know our friend George has talked about this a lot and he's got some great content on it, but the way they're going to do it is the dangerous part. And they're going to do it ultimately not initially, but ultimately it'll be through a digital currency, like, you know, a digital dollar or fed coin. It'll come on our phone. They can program that money. That money is programmable. And that's what's scary about it, Ken, where they can say, look, you can only spend that money within a five mile radius of your home, or you have to spend it within 30 days or it expires or it loses value. So they can do all sorts of financial engineering and social engineering that is really quite scary. But that's another topic. Yeah, for no, I, I talked to George Gammon about that exact yeah. issue. It'll just come into your app and, and yeah. then they can put a set of controls around it. So and they can decide what you're going to get to spend it on, what you're not. And, and, you know, the idea of having cash is a civil rights issue because the way you spend your money should be private. Maybe you don't want the government to know how you spend your money and that should be your right. So let's talk about this. I get this question a lot. Uh, in fact, it's probably the question I get. Uh, what advice are you giving your investors and the people that you're educating to help buy in some of these markets who have tenants uh, that are have tr trouble paying? Because obviously it is trickle up. What are you telling them to do? We deal in the world of single family homes, and we really have had very few instances of tenants not paying rent. I mean, there are a few, but they're, they're not many. In the more institutional world that you play in of apartments, and especially these aren't your apartments so much, but other institutional landlords that are investing in, in you know, workforce housing where they have a lot of restaurant workers and so forth, those people are really struggling. And the landlords are finding creative ways to, to work with people. But I would say, number one, approach things from an era of compassion, because this is not the, t you know, normally, I would say you, you got to be strict with your tenants, because society falls apart when people don't obey the contract, right? You, you got to have people obey contracts, or you just, you have chaos, it, it just doesn't work. Tenants are great at inventing all sorts of sob stories, and that's certainly true in the normal world, right? And we really got to take them with a grain of salt. Mostly, don't believe them, okay? But in today's world, you know, a lot of those stories are true, and people are having a hard time. And regardless of whether you believe them or not, you may not have the choice, right? Now, the interesting thing is, you can still take the tenant to court and get a judgment against them for the money they owe you, but you can't kick them out. Remember, whenever you have a tenant defaulting on their rent obligation, there are two forms of action. Number one is an unlawful detainer, meaning you remove them from the property so you can put a tenant in the property that will pay you, right? And that's just eviction. But number two is getting a judgment for rent owed. That Those are two different roads. Okay. Usually they come together, but not always. So you can still take a collection action, at least in most jurisdictions, I think, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, so don't quote me on this stuff. But in a lot of jurisdictions, especially the Socialist Republic of California <laughs> and the Socialist Republic of New York, you got real problems if you're a landlord in those places, because you just have no rights. It's not going to be your choice and your savvy business dealings and your kind heart that is going to guide your actions. It's going to be very anti-landlord, landlord unfriendly regulations. I agree. So let's let's jump over to businesses. Uh, obviously, uh, I, I just went on and, and saw that, you know, obviously we're well over 100,000 businesses that are permanently closed. And, um, yeah. you, you know, we don't really know. A lot of them are, have run out of PPP money. A lot of them are trying to uh, adapt to these new changes in be people's behaviors. And, and, and obviously if you own an office, uh, or, you know, uh, something at the bottom of an office building and, <laughs> and nobody's going to work anymore, that coffee shop, that donut shop, yeah. that dry cleaner, that, 
you know, lunch place, the dinner place, the whatever, um, you know, those are all going to be hurting. And so what people don't realize, I think, well, maybe they do, but, uh, you know, there's going to, we're going to start to see massive state tax revenues go down because yeah. people own those, what well, one, those sales, those are real sales tax. Oh, yeah. um, those are, you know, there's lots of taxes paid all over the place, including the, the, the building itself. Yep. Um, so what do you, what do you see, you know, happening next? Cause nobody's really talking about this yep. massive tax issue that the States, you know, if oh, you just yeah. want to pick on New York city, um, uh, might as well, or, you know, or, or, you know, San Francisco or Chicago or whatever, yeah. um, you, you know, these cities are not going to have the tax revenue that they had yet. They're certainly not going to shrink their expenses down. So what yeah. do you, you think is going to happen? Ken, I think uh, I have the perfect sound effect for it. <laughs> it is bad, bad, bad news. And it affects these geographical areas unevenly. And mostly those are the left leaning high density urban environments that are already, they were already suffering. These are places where businesses were already leaving. And now the crisis has just accelerated that problem so dramatically. So the tax base is going to be just diminished. It's it's awful. Sales taxes, you didn't mention property taxes, but there's going to be a lot of property tax defaults. These office buildings, these retail centers, they're not going to be paying their taxes. They're not. There's not going to be the sales tax revenue and the income tax base is leaving too. Because, you know, people that worked, for example, in New York City, and by the way, I think this is going in two rounds. You know, they've moved outside of the city and maybe they moved to New Jersey, which is no tax friendly place either. Right. But it is more suburban in some parts or, you know, they've moved one step away. But now that they realize that, you know, maybe they can keep their job or they've spent some of this lockdown time studying business or starting a business and you know, they're going to move farther away into a less expensive jurisdiction with lower taxes even and more space, more breathing room. And we talked about that on the other video I did with you on pandemic investing. But I think it is a huge problem. And we are going to see municipal bankruptcies. And it may not take the form of an actual bankruptcy in quotes, but insolvency, I'll put it that way. And we're going to see pressure on the federal government to bail them out. And they may or may not do that. I don't know. Services will be cut. Crime will increase as police and fire protection is cut and services are cut dramatically. And what you didn't mention, but I know you were thinking of it, Ken, is that all of these commercial mortgage-backed securities another giant tidal wave of defaults that will affect investors. You know, so on that other round I mentioned, you know, if you own municipal bonds, wow, that's not looking good. If you own commercial mortgage-backed securities of any kind, that is not looking good. Now, there's some commercial properties that aren't so bad. There are some retail properties that aren't so bad. Certainly your commercial properties, apartments, that are in high demand. So those are okay. Industrial properties are doing pretty well. Warehouses are big now with online shopping and so forth. But office and retail, not looking so good. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who don't understand what he just said about commercial mortgage-backed securities, what happens is when I go get a loan, um, I get debt, and then it gets sold off in the secondary market. And so it might be sitting in one of your pension plans or in, yeah. or in one of your retirement plans. And so... Pension groups invest in mortgages and so do insurance companies. They invest in mortgages. And so as those start to default, um, obviously nothing gets paid and, and it ends up basically in your quarterly statement. So yeah. that's that's uh, that's also another wave that's coming. Uh, Jason, uh, awesome. Thank you. As always, I appreciate you being on. You're a wealth of information. Hey, Ken, my pleasure. Happy investing to you and all of your uh, listeners and viewers.